Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Planting a Woodland Edge, brought to you by Loudoun County Public Library and the Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy. I'm Lorraine Moffa, Programming Coordinator for the Loudoun County Public Library, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Matt Bright is the Executive Director at Earth Sangha, where he has worked full-time on native plant cons conservation since 2011. He works closely with ecologists, botanists, and park managers across the Northern Virginia region on plant conservation and ecological restoration projects, and he regularly teaches for the Arlington Regional Master Naturalist Chapter. He also serves on the steering committee for the National Capital Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. Before we turn the program over to Matt, BJ LaCrone, Audubon at Home Ambassador and Online Outreach Specialist for Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy has some information. BJ? Thanks, Lorraine. Yeah, thank you everyone for attending um, our co-sponsor program with the library and Matt Wright of Earth Sangha on planting a woodland edge. Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy is a membership-based nonprofit whose mission is to inspire motivate and engage people to protect, preserve, and restore wildlife habitat in Loudoun County. The reason we do this is that the greatest threat to wildlife worldwide is loss of habitat. We accomplish our miss mission by providing advocacy, education, citizen science, and habitat conservation programs. As a membership organization, we rely on the generosity of our members to provide support for our programs and not charge for them. If you aren't already a member, please become one and help us protect and preserve wildlife. So we really appreciate Matt's time tonight and I'll pass it over to him. Then if anyone has any question, please just type it in the chat box and I'll pass it on to Matt at the end of the program. Matt? Great, uh, thanks so much everyone. Thanks for having me. Thank you for the, the great introductions uh, there. Um, so, without uh, further ado, we'll we'll jump right into talking about planting a uh, woodland edge. And I'll I'll just preface this by saying that uh, I interpreted the brief of woodland edge um, in a, a fairly broad context. You know, I wanted to to discuss um, not just woodland edges, but a lot of our sort of transitional and liminal spaces. But before we jump into that. Uh, I thought I would just do a quick sort of introduction of the kind of work uh, we do at, at the Earth Sangha. Um, these are a few photos uh, uh, at our wild plant nursery. Um, our nursery is our sort of keystone project. So out, out at our nursery in Grove Point Park in Fairfax County, we grow uh, a little over 300 species all told, though at any given time our inventory probably co hovers closer to 250 or so. Um, and we distribute more than 65,000 plants uh, a year now out of that. Um, so, you know, uh, we're a big grower by sort of local, exclusively local uh, ecotype native plants standards. But in the big scheme of things, we are still a, a pretty small grower. Uh, and we, we really try and steer a, a large number of those plants to, to um, our public lands to conservation efforts, uh, as well as supplying those to homeowners and uh, people looking to create, reestablish, or improve the quality of habitat on private lands. I know that, that this is probably um, this notion here about uh, um, what is a, a native plant is, is probably something that, that most of you are, are familiar with, but I, I like including um, some information about this so we're sort of all on the same page. And so we're really when we think about what we mean when we talk about nativity, it is really a three point, uh, a three part test, right? So we have um, species that much must naturally occur here. These are not things that we've introduced or moved around uh, accidentally. Um, that the reason that they're important is because they form these co-evolved uh, relationships with other organisms. And the, that may be um, things like our wildlife, our native birds, uh, our small mammals, our reptiles, amphibians, our insects. Um, it can be things as, as cryptic as soil, fungi, and bacteria. And it can even be things like other plants. And in every every situation, we're talking about a particular place. So you can zoom into nativity, uh, to a very, very high degree and talk about things that are native to this particular park, to this exact site. And you can zoom out and talk about um, nativity on a, a more uh, 
regional scale too. Um, in the context of this organization, of this presentation, when I say native, really, I mean native to nor Northern Virginia. And as we talk about those co evolved uh, relationships, why getting these native plants back into um, our ecosystems back into our habitats? Um, the reason we want to do that is because we want our native plants to foster. Uh, life and some of that life is charismatic, you know, things like hummingbirds and and monarch uh, butterflies and warblers. But a lot of it and a lot of very important uh, wildlife is not charismatic. And so I, I have this photo here of this very uncharismatic eastern uh, tent caterpillar. This species is a specialist in one of our more common native trees here. That's black cherry. Uh, black cherry is a tree that you find very, very frequently. Uh, reestablishing as a, a sort of early, uh, early to mid successional sort of species on our forest edges. And it serves a very important role. So not only does black cherry, um, you know, flower uh, and it's insect pollinated and you will get, you know, native bees coming to that. And not only are its fruit an important food source for our native birds, but the, uh, the leaves are an essential food source for a number of insect herbivores. And that relationship between our native plants and with insect herbivores is, is really, I believe, our most critical ecological relationship between native plants and other wildlife, other organisms. And the reason that's so important is because insects really form uh, such an important uh, sort of bridge between the, the plants themselves and all sorts of other wildlife. Um, so what we find then is that a, a huge number of birds eat insects. So something like 90% of bird species will eat insects at some point in their life. Um, if you're looking at, at birds that, that depend on insects for more or less their exclusive food source, that's still like 70% uh, of our songbirds are going to be eating those things. So th this is a really, really important group of things. And of the insects they want to eat, a lot of them are caterpillars. They are le lepidopterans. They are moths and butterflies. So a lot of this is work that researchers like Desiree Narango, Doug Tallamy uh, have been doing and talking about the importance of fostering habitat um, for our insect herbivores, for our moths and butterflies. Uh, and obviously our native species are a really uh, important way of doing that. If we look at, at some of their research and, and this flyer here, is from um, research by Desiree Narango, Doug Tallamy, and Peter Mara. Uh, and this research was done in the DC area. Um, what they found is that really you need, um, in order to sustain a population of uh, chickadees, and they use chickadees as a model organism uh, for this because chickadees are otherwise well adapted for an urban, suburban uh, sort of habitat, that you really need something like 70% plant biomass, and they, they calculated this by looking at the height of trees and the spread of them uh, and using that, uh, using uh, measures derived from that, from the height and the spread of trees to figure out what percentage of, of the total plant material in somebody's yard in a city block um, is native. And what they found is that their model sort of said, well, these things probably aren't, aren't surviving and aren't raising their young to adulthood at a rate that would um, allow those populations um, to continue to sustain themselves if you're below 70% um, native plant biomass. And what's interesting is that they found that actually there's, there's a lot of benefit to getting beyond 70%, that, that those numbers tend to kind of tick upwards more and more as, as you, you gain more cover. Um, so 70% was, uh, again, a minimum threshold, uh, a goal, uh, but it's not the ideal number going from 70 to 80% native plant biomass to 90% native plant biomass um, will definitely, um, you know, create improvements. And uh, obviously we have to talk about what kind of habitat that is, but I, I like to put that 70% number in a little bit of context because most of the urban suburban landscape, um, and we will talk about you know, our problems with um, how we've we've developed our landscape, and I say we just as, as human beings, um, that we don't have a lot of natural areas left. 
So if you look in Fairfax County, I believe when I pulled this number, they've actually acquired a little bit more land, but it's sitting just shy of 10%. Um, you know, in Arlington County, it's it's sitting a little bit under 9%. Um, I did not find uh, numbers for, for Loudoun County, um, but, you know, at, at the end, if, if the Loudoun wildlife folks know what total parkland in Loudoun County, I'd be curious to know. Um, but in any case, I'll bet it's not 70%. And so what, what that tells us is that with these relatively small areas of parkland, um, that that it's not enough for our parks to be the only reservoirs um, for wildlife and for native plants. We have to bring that conservation value out into private lands, into our backyards. Um, and a really important way of doing that is to grapple with how do we recreate um, woodland edge habitat, and why is that an important target to try and be conserving and restoring? Um, so th this photo here is uh, a photo of one of our um, former interns. She, she's now actually uh, um, in, employed by Fairfax County. Um, she's behind uh, the person in the, the yellow there in the back, but you can see this area prep there. There are a number of these areas. This is on George Mason's campus that have been prepped, that have been planted. Um, they did a diverse planting. They have trees and shrubs, grasses, uh, wildflowers. And you'll notice that most of the space that we're standing on, from my perspective when I took the photo, um, is lawn. And most of the space that they were working on is lawn too. And there's a forest fragment there with you know pretty decent quality. There, there are oaks in there. Uh, we walked through a few of the sites. There's some viburnums. There are even some blueberries hanging out in there. There's hazelnut. Um, and there's, there is a, a stream uh, restoration component uh, in there as well. And what we have by, by focusing on this reestablishment of this woody edge is one is that we can bring all that habitat forward. Uh, so we create new space that will become good habitat. It's just seedlings right now, so you can't even see it from this distance. But given a few years, we'll have a lot of interesting things coming up, a lot of great habitat there. Another thing that we have in these areas where we have um, we're creating these these woodland edges is that inherently these spaces tend to be very diverse, and that's certainly been my experience of years of seed collecting, um, going out in the field, working with with ecologists and botanists. That these sort of edges, um, what what we call an ecotone. Uh, between two different habitat types, that gradient between the two, um, in a lot of areas tends to be very, very high value. So you tend to get species that can grow in meadows as well as species that can grow in forests, and they're all in there together. Um, unfortunately, what we see, and we'll we'll talk a little bit more in depth about this as we go on, that we have tended to erase those ecotones, those transitional areas from two types of habitat by interrupting them almost entirely. So it's very common for us to see forest fragments that have mature trees and then end abruptly at a street, a road, a mowed lawn, and we don't see that sort of ecotone of patchy trees and open meadow or shrubland or things like that. So, you know, what does a, a sort of reasonable ecotone look like? Um, you can look up academic drawings online. Uh, you know, a lot of these are just kind of pen and ink um, sort of drawings or, uh, you know, uh, sort of computer graphic illustrations of what an idealized scenario looks like. Um, and often it will have, you know, shrubbery, dense successional trees coming up, kind of grading into a meadow. And we certainly have ecotones that look like this. But we often have ecotones that are very patchy. And so this is an area in part of, of Elk Lick Park. Um, there's a, a quite a large swath of meadow off to our left from where I took this photo. Um, it's one of our largest. Uh, I think it might actually be the largest, excuse me, the largest extent meadow in a Fairfax County park. Um, there are sections of it that are quite dry, and there are sections of it that get fairly wet. And this section that I'm standing in is fairly moist. Um, and to the right, we're transitioning into a, uh, a floodplain forest. And what you'll sort of see in, in the kind of white gradient off to the left is, and, and in the distance there, there are a number of trees that are kind of younger canopy trees that are moving out into the field. 
Um, so this field is controlled in part by burning. They do do uh, some mowing along the edge. So you, you do still see um, a somewhat abbreviated ecotone. But because they're allowing some of these shrubbier trees to establish some of these bigger ones, um, you do get this sort of patchwork of some shade, some trees, some more shrubs, and some other things. So, you know, if we, we look at this site, one is that we have this gorgeous state rare Asclepias purpurascens in front here. Um, but we also have, I mean, one, we have a lot of stilt grass, and, and that's plain to see. Uh, but there are a lot of native sedges in the stand, too. There are a lot of native grasses. There were two species of wild rye in here. There's Indian grass um, along that that edge of the forest. We have a lot of viburnum, including a lot of black haw viburnum. And so we see this area, and there's a lot of diversity in here. There's hackberry, there's oaks. Uh, this is a good example of, of what a potential edge could look like. It doesn't need to be a dense, unwalkable uh, line of, say, red cedars. Uh, though, if you like red cedars and, and that's what you want to plant, a whole bunch of red cedars is also a phenomenal choice. Um, but you can also foster some more open spaces. And I, I think what's nice about this photo, uh, even though I didn't manage to get the purple milkweed in focus as I was walking along here, um, is that there is room for designed elements too. If you want to, to use this as a jumping off point for what your backyard should look like, you can think about the placement of those trees and shrubs in a way that's pleasing to you, uh, that you know allows you to, to have an expansive view of your property or wherever you might want to sit and use the, the space. Um, so when, when I talk about creating these habitat edges, um, I think it's important to, to realize it's not just about the habitat value, but we're creating um, spaces for, for people to use too, if, if that's what people are interested in. So when we talk about the recreation of these ecotones, and so, so this, this photo I took here, uh, those are uh, two of my colleagues there, that's uh, Jenny on the left and Michael Ann on the right. Um, we were doing this planting on Halloween, uh, so they came uh, 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 dressed up for that. Uh, but but this is at Lake Fairfax Park, and this is a new smaller meadow that they got established here. This is one of the meadows that Fairfax County manages by burning, um, which in our experience is a very um, progressive and I think forward thinking way of managing our successional and uh, uh, woodland edge habitats. Uh, and I think that it has largely been met with a great deal of success in terms of what the ecosystems or how, how these plant communities are responding. Uh, but, but this is one of these examples. So th this meadow behind them, um, that has not been planted yet. All of those, those native things, we have a lot of native grasses, a lot of golden rods coming back up. That was all kind of came up naturally once they started to burn. And we came in to just work on the edge. So we uh, put in a number of viburnums. We put in a number of more shade tolerant um, grass species. We used a lot of broom sedge uh, on the, these edges. We find that broom sedge is a really excellent choice um, for a lot of our drier forest edges. Uh, and, and we did a number of, uh, uh, of wildflowers too uh, in this area. And this is a way of adding diversity um, as well as a sort of um, adding diversity at a species level, but also adding diversity in a structural sense. So as we if you were to look into the woods that are behind me from where I took the photo, a lot of the shrubs as you get farther into that patch of woods are non-native. And so a lot of the, the native shrubs uh, that exist on that site are actually ones that we planted in as part of this planting. Um, and allowing those to get established um, and to, to grow up will create higher quality habitat than what those invasive plants there are offering. Um, and then allow for further management if um, they decide to go in and manage some of those understory things. We have that that sort of habitat buffer and the ability to work in. So again, you can see how this effort of managing the edge can have positive effects for um, both of these habitat types by bringing in uh, species that could colonize out into the meadow, things like the broom sedge. Um, and by bringing in species that could eventually colonize out into the forest, uh, like the viburnum that we planted. So by, by planting out this edge, what we're really doing is setting the stage for succession, for seed dispersal uh, to take over 
and begin to improve the value of both of those habitat types uh, by us going in and managing those liminal spaces where they grade into each other. One thing I will say, and we will revisit this, is that a lot of our edges, by nature of being a very diverse space, of being areas where you're likely to get um, areas of things that like meadow and full sun, the areas that like shade or woodland edge, um, tend to be very diverse, and they can also tend to be the most badly infested by invasive plants. Um, and so we found them that that element of management can be very, very tricky. And what I caution people about, and I, I say this in general, but what I, I think is, is really critical with our edges is to work top to bottom for invasives removal. So get those vines out of the canopy, then begin working on your shrubs and then tackle the ground layer. Um, but also to to remove first to before you begin planting. It can be very hard if you remove, say, a persistent um, woody ground cover, so you have English ivy or something, excuse me, and you find that once you remove the English ivy, you have a whole lot of stilt grass or garlic mustard or something like that coming up. Um, it can be a real pain to then manage around things that you already planted in those spaces. So understanding the sort of things that might naturally uh, re re regenerate out before planting can be a very important technique. I, I wanted to back up briefly because I mentioned succession a few times in terms of how we view our restoration efforts. And I, I think that this is a really important ecological sort of concept. Um, I, I imagine that a number of people are very um, familiar with this already, uh, but you have, th this is um, a, a graphic here from uh, an, an, an ecology textbook, and it, it takes you through sort of primary succession about initial colonization of um, a totally barren landscape. Uh, that's typically not what we're dealing with here. If you're reclaiming areas that used to be paved uh, and they're removing the concrete and things like that, areas where the soils have been totally scraped, um, you may be dealing with something that is really more akin to primary succession. But usually we're dealing with areas that have, have undergone some kind of secondary succession and disturbance. Um, sometimes that disturbance, or I should say usually now, um, that disturbance is mostly a negative thing, right? Something bad has happened to the landscape. Um, that kind of disturbance can drive invasive species into the site, um, which then further cause more disturbance and, and de degradation of the site. So breaking out of that cycle um, can be uh, an important goal of uh, restoration on site. But I will mention that a lot of those sort of cycles of disturbance and succession that used to occur were really kind of natural and co-evolved elements of our landscape. Um, so we knew we know that that people were here in eastern North America potentially as far back as 14 or 15,000 years ago. There are archaeological sites in Virginia that, that date back about that far. Um, and Virginia climactically um, was a very different place 14 or 15,000 years ago. Um, but it is very likely that a lot of our plant communities evolved in situ on these sites with people doing burns on them and uh, keeping those those meadow areas maintained and that that people burning those spaces was a part of these sort of natural cycles. Um, we know that there were uh, we had a lot more uh, grazing animals that there are our historical records of bison still in DC proper as late as the 1780s. Um, so we obviously had more grassland um, and more sort of meadow plant communities um, in the past than we do today. We also likely had more wetland habitats, and we can think of these edges, these ecotones, as also existing in gradients from wetland to dry land um, or from wet meadows uh, to wet forests. And uh, so we we have a lot of those those cycles that would have been happening, and those would have been natural cycles, and those would have also contributed to a diverse sort of habitat. Um, and today we don't have those so much, and we'll talk about that in a second. This is just a quick aside. Um, my, my wife and I, a number of years ago, went to New Zealand, and this is a volcanic landscape um, in New Zealand. And this is a good example of what primary succession looks like. You know, th these are plants colonizing relatively new soil here. Uh, we don't have to dwell on this. I just thought this would be a fun aside because 
it is not very frequently, um, unless you, I guess you live in New Zealand, um, that you get to see this kind of primary successional habitat, um, you know, following really big disruptions like that. So to, to go back to, to the point I was making about those sort of cycles of succession happening, if we zoom out and think about those, those sort of cycles happening, <laughs> excuse me, those sort of cycles of disturbance happening across a landscape, what we would tend to get is a sort of mosaic or a sort of patchwork, right? So it, this here is a study. Um, I have the, the title and the authors there um, that was, was done in Europe. But one of the things that they found was that these sort of patchworks of landscapes, which are in some cases, you know, natural components, as we just discussed, are more resilient, more stable, and more diverse than more homogenous land use. So the goal doesn't necessarily have to be to have forests covering every end of Northern Virginia. Um, and the goal shouldn't be the other end, grasslands covering every edge or wetlands covering edge, every, you know, um, every bit of square footage. Um, you know, we already have built up so much of it that we can't do that anyway. Um, but a diversity of habitat um, there's, it's not just studies in Europe, but there's a, a diversity of habitat, um, is really an evidence supported way to build diverse and stable and resilient habitats. Um, it is important to, to recognize, I think too, that this isn't newfangled. Uh, again, this goes back to how the Eastern North American landscape had been managed for thousands of years. Um, and it's really more recent, uh, land use and disturbance patterns. Uh, that we've placed upon the landscape that have altered these historical arrangements. And crucially, people have been at the center of a lot of this, um, these sort of arrangements in North America. So I think it's really important that we don't view ourselves as totally outside of this, that, um, that humans have been an important part of the sort of um, ecological function of wild areas in, in North America and Eastern North America for a very, very long time. And that we should work towards a a sort of you know a a sensible and and sensitive land ethic that allows us to go back in and and frankly reclaim our mantle um, as stewards of of our natural areas. So when when we think about those those sort of patch dynamics from that that previous study, right? When we 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 think about um, you know how are those little patches getting established and, and covered. So I, I realize that patch dynamics may not be something that, that most gardeners, uh, most landowners think about, and it can be a difficult concept to think about on small scales. But um, I, I wrote out some bullet points kind of just roughly describing what these patches are. And so when I say a patch, I mean a kind of habitat. So when I say a patch, it could be a forest, it could be a meadow, it could be a marsh or a swamp, um, but some kind of habitat. Uh, so following disturbance, something gets established, um, and then those those patches kind of get connected up with each other. Uh, they grow towards each other as succession happens, right? As as trees begin to grow up, those individual trees come together, and you have a forest and a few different patches of those trees growing closer together and dropping seed and creating more trees over time makes up a bigger forest. Um, what would be happening naturally is that some of those areas would be burning again, or like this beaver that I photographed at GMU's campus um, might be dying back because a beaver is damming some creek and killing a lot of the trees and allowing a marsh or something um, to flourish. It, what doesn't happen currently so much is that sort of flux of landscape up and down um, from, you know, sort of a late successional forest back down into a meadow. That's not something that we see in the urban suburban landscape. We tend to choose if we are having a meadow in a space, a wetland in a space, a forest in a space or something else. Uh, and then we tend to leave them in those areas. Um, there are a lot of practical reasons why that is done. And this certainly isn't my intent to criticize land managers in this talk and say, oh, well, really what we should be doing is of filling in our wetlands and creating new wetlands elsewhere. Um, that's certainly not my, my intent, but that by managing those edges, those transitional areas, um, I think we can capture a lot of that habitat that would look like those mid successional areas, those areas that are in between those changes um, and provide a lot of the habitat, the ecological value through that targeted application of reestablishing 
our edge habitats, our ecotones. So there are a number of species that really require some kind of, of disturbance in here. So um, th this is a, a, a meadow and a power line easement, and, and this is probably, um, at least in Fairfax County, one of the best blooms of Asclepias tuberosa that, that we've seen. Um, our Asclepias tuberosa, that is our butterfly weed, has a number of pro problems, um, at least in our area, um, the least of which is not is is that deer actually eat the seed pods. Um, so even when they flower well, uh, the deer come in and eat the seed pods. Um, what we also tend to find with some of these species, and I think our, our less common milkweed, so things like our butterfly weed, things like our clasping milkweed, this is Clepius amplexicollis, um, these seem to respond positively to disturbance, whether that's mowing, whether that's burning, um, but something that, that really turns up uh, those, those uh, meadow systems, and they tend to bounce back uh, and flower a whole lot. Uh, immediately post that. And there's been a number of research on species that do this, and, and, and actually some of that research was on rare milkweeds. And they find that linking up disturbance patterns like that is a really great way of getting them all to bloom together so they get reconnected by all getting pollinated by each other at the same time. Um, I think the synthesis of this, if you're thinking about managing in your own yard, and, and this is something that we've had people talk about um, you know, when they, they plant a lot of native plants, it's, oh, you know, this species has crowded out another species or so on and so forth. And, you know, sometimes we ask, well, did you try digging up any of that or cutting the other one back? And I think oftentimes people uh, are a little reluctant or even sometimes afraid to do that. Um, and so I, I want you to, to feel empowered uh, to go in into your small spaces. And, you know, I, I'm a big believer that, that those aggressive common plants belong in your garden. If, if you want them there, um, I, I think that there's a lot of research that shows they're valuable, right? So getting goldenrod back into your garden is probably the most important step that you can take to protect our native pollinators, including our specialist bees. Um, but you should also feel empowered if you're planting our common goldenrods, like early goldenrod or, or gray goldenrod, and you're trying to keep a patch of, say, locally native Liatris pilosa or Asclepias tuberosa intact and it's encroaching, dig up some of the goldenrod. That's a great thing to share with friends. It's a great thing to take to a school pollinator garden, uh, you know, maybe their library uh, pollinator gardens that, that could accommodate that. Perhaps you could set up a little group to do a plant swap. Um, but but these are things that, that again, to my point of that, we, we need to be, um, you know, both gentle but assertive uh, sort of managers of, of these spaces. And I'm, uh, again, I'm, I'm not telling people don't go into parks and start digging up plants uh, willy nilly. A absolutely not. Uh, but in your own garden, um, you know, you, you should feel um, that, that you are prepared to manage these things and go in and, and thin out some species and, and promote other species. And indeed, in my, my own garden, this is something that, that we do quite a lot. Um, when we're talking about, you know, what what flaws, I guess, do we see in more traditional management of ecotones? We, I think we we've, we've talked a good deal about why we want to have these ecotones and these woodland edges and what we may want to put in there. Um, I think it's important to note how a lot of traditional um, ways of viewing the landscape has really limited that appeal. So uh, this is a path by a school in uh, Reston. And um, actually a, a number of this was, was planted out. We helped to do some of the replanting, um, but they decided that they, they didn't like the sight lines, um, especially near the path. And so they brush hog this. Um, and so not only did that kill a lot of things that, that we planted, so kind of personally annoying, um, but you can see that the way that they chose to mow, especially by going all the way up that hill back to where that forest edge is, that pretty much eliminated any of that possibility um, for that that sort of shrubby ecotone uh, or sort of seedlings of canopy trees to be coming up. Uh, and then they mowed a bit on the other side too. So again, you have this sort of area, of, even if the meadow on the left side were in a pristine condition, you still really diminish the connectivity between those two spaces. 
And so that may be okay for say butterflies and bees, which can fly and our birds, um, but that may be very dramatic level of disconnection um, for smaller critters that have to crawl over there. Um, so, you know, these things, they, for us, you know, we're, we're big and we're very mobile and it's easy for us to traverse the landscape. It's important to remember that this kind of disruption um, can be much more severe um, to little tiny critters that need cover uh, to go from one end um, of a habitat to another. And, and crucially that, that this kind of, of management style um, doesn't promote the same kind of diversity of, of habitat and the same diversity of species. Um, certainly having some meadow habitat on the left there instead of just mowed lawn is an improvement. Um, so I'll give credit where credit is due, um, but I, I think it's a real missed opportunity to create a lot better uh, sort of edge. So when we're talking about planting out woodland edge, I think there are a lot of different paths that that can take. And I touched on this a little bit, that it doesn't just have to be meadow to forest, right? Um, so this this large uh, photo here, this is at Royal Lake Park in Burke. Uh, this is sort of my local park. I, I walk here with, with, with my family, uh, with, with, with my daughter a lot. Um, and you can see this this edge that I'm standing in taking this photo, you can see we have some red chokeberry. Uh, we have some native goldenrods. There are a few other species around here. There's hibiscus that they put in. Um, there's some native iris and in, in other parts. Um, this area used to be just mowed lawn all the way to the edge of the lake, um, at least in this patch. And they, they really made a, an effort to create this sort of habitat here. If, if you visit in the summer, um, I, I counted three or four nesting pairs of, of red winged blackbird making use of this space. Um, throughout the winter, we saw a number of uh, actually a few of the red winged blackbirds seem to stick around. Um, we saw other birds kind of coming, to, uh, coming and foraging in there. Um, so this is really, really well used space uh, and a, a great opportunity to create something that's that's really, really valuable. Um, and crucially, because they did this, and, and again, this is taking the human element into account, that they they did this in a way that would not obscure the view of the lake. So I'm I'm in it and I'm squatting in the brush here, uh, but there's quite a steep hill behind me. So you have a lot of area to view open water um, and, and to see that and, and, and to, you know, uh, um, continue to access the lake. There is there is a boat landing uh, off to my left in this photo. Um, the, the top right photo is uh, an invasives removal uh, that we did at Mason District Park in, in, in Annandale. Um, We've been using sort of applied nucleation techniques. I can talk a little bit about that in, in Q and A if we have time for that at the end. Um, but a lot of what we're doing here uh, is actually the invasives removal. We find that there's a lot of deer browse, um, and there are pockets of pretty serious invasives. But also our seed bank is really really good at this site, and we see a lot of good uh, re regeneration. So our big targets have been to go in, protect things from deer browse to allow the natural regeneration to happen and to remove the invasive species that are slowing or uh, arresting that uh, native regeneration from happening. And as you can see, this is a pretty open uh, patch. This is, this is definitely an ecotone. There's an open place behind me. There is meadow habitat going there and there are a number of trails crisscrossing here. Uh, this is a really great space for, for recreating that, that sort of habitat. And I think crucially, and, and this is one of these, these sort of um, uh, spaces that, that we talk about across all of these, and I'll talk about the next, uh, the bottom slot, the bottom photo there in a second. Across all these spaces, one of our big, big takeaways in terms of of how to manage them, if as we get to the practical component, what, what should I put in the ground? And, and I will say, my goal of this talk, as you might have gathered, is not to give you a list specifically of things that you can plant everywhere, because um, there's enough diversity across. I, I know that, you know, folks from Loudoun County, I know that just one jurisdiction, but that's over 500 square miles. I'm sure there's some folks from Fairfax in here too. That's another 400 square miles. Um, that's a lot of diversity in habitat. That's a lot of diversity in plant communities and topography and soil types. Um, and I, I'm a big believer in 
um, taking the time to develop those plant lists. I will have my contact information at the end. If you have specific, what should I plant right here questions, you can shoot an email to me, uh, myself or someone from my team can certainly help with that. Uh, but as a, a, a general category, getting our native shrubs back into uh, edges is our sort of top priority. I'll talk about that with our next slide. Uh, and this bottom photo here, uh, this is Lewinsville Park in McLean. Uh, we did a number of sort of applied nucleation plantings. That is, we put trees and shrubs all together, uh, along with some herbaceous plants as well, some grasses, some flowers, caged them all up as a unit uh, from deer. That dramatically reduced our costs um, for deer caging. We, we dropped our costs down by about 80%. Uh, for what we were spending for for deer caging, we found that it's a pretty durable way of doing it, um, and that also allows us to get a great diversity of plants in. Uh, they they do tend to grow pretty quickly in in those dense settings, and then over time, uh, they will begin to drop seed, drive um, uh, succession on those sites, and we'll begin to see uh, some of those uh, transitions occur across the landscape. <laughs> so as we move from our park examples. Um, into our our home example. So uh, this is a photo of my wife Catherine. This is my, my daughter Maeve there um, when she was uh, uh, just over a year old, I think, in that photo. Um, and and here we are in in our backyard. And so I, I think our backyard has a pretty interesting um, sort of mix of things to it. So you can see the big white flowers there are our native elderberry. The shrub in the foreground with the smaller kind of pale green, pale yellow flowers is strawberry bush. Uh, again, if you're working in an area with a lot of deer browse, which I, I would say is all of Northern Virginia, um, getting strawberry bush back into protected areas, if you have a fenced in backyard, um, that's really phenomenal. It's a species that we see, we should be seeing a lot more than we're currently seeing it. And when we do see it, it's often so badly deer browse that it doesn't produce a lot of seed. Um, so you are absolutely contributing uh, to helping to protect a local population of a species that is is trending in decline by getting that that back in. Um, as as you work into other parts of, of the yard, I think to the left of, of my my wife and daughter there, um, you can see that we just have a little maple leaf viburnum kind of growing out. We have a number of viburnum species. Uh, in our yard, both both uh, uh, maple leaf, um, uh, black haw viburnum, and viburnum dentatum, we have in there. Uh, not not pictured is some of the hazelnuts uh, that we have. We have winterberry holly in here, um, and our our canopy is is relatively um, unimpressive. It is uh, the the actual top canopy is a hundred percent tulip tree. That's probably our most common tree through most of our forest types. Uh, around here, uh, we did plant in some oaks and hickories, uh, some of which are starting to get big. Some are, are still seedlings, but we're working to to diversify that. Um, and we did remove some hazard trees over time. We've had to take down a few trees over the years. And as that opened up habitat, we use that as an opportunity to plant in to replace those trees with oak and hickory, those high value uh, canopy trees that will come back in, but also to get to take advantage of that extra light and to get some more shrubs and things in. And, and you can see we have a diverse uh, herbaceous layer too. We have things like uh, our native Persicaria virginiana. We have a variety of native grasses and sedges. Um, our backyard, because we're on a slope, it, it gets fairly wet. Um, and so we, we've had a, you know, a number of plants that like it a little bit more moist, especially in areas uh, where we've had to divert some of the water flow that's coming along um, and, and we also have, have a, a, a patch of native ferns that's just out of frame here too. Um, so you can see this is this is a small lot. Uh, so you know we we live in the Burke area of Fairfax County. Um, our lot's about a quarter acre. You know this is not a lot of space, uh, but we've managed to fit a lot of diversity uh, and crucially a lot of different habitats. So our, our front yard we don't have any canopy trees. Uh, we have a few successional trees. We have some uh, uh, younger red cedars. Um, we have a hop horn beam, uh, but we do have a lot of, of meadow habitat. Uh, and in the back, we've had this kind of transition area. And then in, in, in the final bit, it's really more of a forest interior. So we, we really kind of created um, our yard to be a little bit of an ecotone as well. 
and, and I should mention all, all those plants I mentioned are, are things we grow. So if, if this is inspiring to you, um, obviously it takes a good deal of time for things to get to be this size. Uh, but, but these are all plants that, 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 that we grow uh, at our wild plant nursery. Um, I, I wanted to, to point out too that, you know, we have a lot of great edge habitat in a lot of our parks. So th this is part of Lake Akiton Park. This is right by the parking lot. Um, you know, I, I just swung open the door, leaned forward and took this photo. Um, the that the the yellow flowers there uh, is a, a native sunflower here in the anthus uh, decapetalus there and then farther up in in the frame there is a lot of invasive rosa multiflora you can also see a few native asters kind of growing in there you know there's some poison ivy uh, it, it is native it is valuable to a lot of wildlife I totally understand why people don't want it in their yard um, and there are a few golden rods and some other things um, what what this woodland edge really needs is just rem removal of um of of those invasives that that are suppressing it you know and and depending on on where you live what your property looks like maybe you back up onto a park um one of the most effective and enduring changes you can do is to simply remove the bad actors from the site to simply get rid of those invasive species um and so going in removing that uh the rosa multiflora would be uh the top priority there um, and just seeing what what comes up can can do a lot to dramatically improve the the habitat value there. And as we begin to think about again what what to plant, I'm a big big booster for getting our most common species out there first. Uh, one is that it's just easy to find the habitat for them. If we're working from a right place, right plant sort of concept, it's a lot easier. If you choose a common plant, they have a lot more right places. Um, so th this is a photo I took at Manassas National Battlefield Park. Uh, this is near the deep cut area. Um, I, I was just astounded by, by just how beautiful a morning uh, it was out there. Um, but it was also dominated. There are a lot of cool things. There are, there are a lot of uncommon things. There are, there are a few rare things in there. Um, but the vast majority of what you see um, are common species. And so you, you don't need to have um, things that, that are rare or uncommon um, to really be exceptionally beautiful. And you don't need things necessarily that are rare or uncommon to drive a lot of, of high quality uh, uh, habitat and ecological interactions. So if you look at the research that folks like Sam Drogi and Jared Fowler, and this is, was research done uh, really right here on, on, on uh, most on, on the Maryland side of the DC suburbs. Um, they looked at, at what are using our, our uh, what, what are our specialist bees feeding on? And they found overall that they're going to the things that a lot of generalist bees are going to as well. They're going to goldenrods, they're going to sunflowers, they're going to asters of, of various sorts. Um, and so that's really, really good news that we can create good habitat for the less common wildlife at the same time that we're doing it for common things. Um, if we wanna protect our birds and those, those charming insect herbivores, uh, like our tent caterpillars early on. This research, again, done by Desiree Narongo by Dictalamy. Um, what, what they found is that it's our common trees and shrubs that are doing this. So oaks, uh, cherries, uh, willows are among the, the most important uh, genera. And um, I, I would say between just those three uh, genera between our oaks, uh, our, our uh, willows, and you can just think of just our common black willow as the stand in and prunus and just our common black cherry. Um, if you have space for a tree, you can accommodate something from one of those three species. Um, and if you're looking to plant a tree, I would recommend, strongly recommend that you choose something from those as a first shot, uh, especially if you don't have a lot of trees on your property already. And again, I wanted to, to mention too that, that you know this is a point I keep coming to with the invasives removal being a really important tool. Uh, in some cases, you may not need to do anything. Uh, that you know this this is an example of a site. This is at like Fairfax Park. Um, I will say I have not been back to this site since uh, uh, more recently. It could be that a lot of deer browse has happened, but I'm hoping a lot of these trees are a lot taller, even if not all of them still exist. Uh, but this is a great bit of what good quality forest regeneration looks like following a mass year. This is a ton of our very high quality Crocus alba, our white oak coming back up. Um, you know, if your backyard looks anything like this, 
uh, your work is done. You have a, a phenomenal habitat. Congratulations. Um, you know, set up a folding chair and just admire what you have. And I did, as as we get towards the end of the presentation here, I'm hoping I'm leaving some time for um, for uh, questions and, and my responses. Uh, but I, I love to, you know, end on on a few sort of positive notes. And so one of them is this this phenomenal bit of research by uh, Ellen Domshin. I'm, I'm sure I'm getting her name wrong and I apologize. Uh, but she did this this really interesting research. Um, it was not from right around here. It was looking at pine savanna habitat. So in, into the, 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 the southeast, I believe. And what they found was that um, habitats were that are connected even tenuously. So you don't need to have your forest right up above another forest. Her experimental design had patches that were separated by 100, 150 meters and very, very narrow corridors of habitat. But what they found was that that connection, even a very tenuous, a very small connection, um, made both of the bigger patches in between. Over time, they became more diverse. They saw more recruitment of native species. That is, native species found their ways into those patches and stayed there. Uh, they lost fewer species, so they were more resilient to that disturbance, that they they didn't see extirpation events of losing species happen at the same rate uh, that those those connected ones were uh, in, in better condition over time. And her re research really suggested that that probably gets more durable the longer those connections are there. And so she really, uh, you know, I, I think ended that that research with really a plea that we need to begin reconnecting our habitat now, even as we under begin are beginning to understand all of that entails uh, ecologically, all the benefits of that. And there's a lot that we can do in our private lands to make that happen. So well, one thing that we can do is we can advocate for the creation of more high quality ads like this. Uh, this planting we did at the Fairfax County uh, Government Center to, to buffer this edge. Um, we can, you know, work with with our schools and schoolyards to uh, improve the the edge habitat or establish new habitat or pollinator gardens. But getting even just a mature canopy tree or, or starting with a seedling and hope, hopefully coming up to a mature canopy tree of something native like an oak, a black cherry, um, you know, creating native landscaping in and around our yards. Um, that is helping to create this sort of connectivity. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that we can that that we can do that's tangible that will absolutely make a difference in um, in easing our uh, you know sort of biodiversity crisis of offering a softer landing um, for our wildlife that that depends on these sort of habitats. Um, and there's increasing evidence that it it is helping on a local scale to mediate some of the drivers of climate change so that we can we create more habitat if we create more tree canopy, uh, more diverse um, herbaceous communities and crucially taller uh, uh, herbaceous communities. So like meadows instead of turf, all of that plays into ameliorating some of our urban heat island effect. Um, that obviously won't solve climate change, but it's a part of the puzzle of making climate resilient landscapes. Uh, the other thing I, I just wanted to show off kind of two, two areas of, of high quality edge uh, that were both in challenging locations. So this left one's at, at Dyke Marsh. It's a National Park Service property along the George Washington Memorial Parkway. Um, very, very diverse sort of uh, area here right behind me is the Potomac. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm only 10 feet away from it. Um, so th this is very much an edge sort of habitat. We have blue mist flower, we have bear's foot, um, all sorts of interesting uh, native things coming up. Uh, they had native vines coming back up on the edge, you know, our y y yellow passion flower coming up. Um, and they also planted in a number of things, but a lot of that came up on their own. Um, and this other part is uh, Windmill Hill Park. This is right by the waterfront in the city of Alexandria. Um, this was an invaded slope and they didn't want to mow it, uh, both because that's expensive, it burns a lot of gas, and because that slope is too steep to safely mow. Uh, we planted a diverse uh, meadow with successional trees. And, and the goal was uh, to allow the, the successional trees to take over. So if you were to go look at that today, at least the last time I was out there, 
um, it's a dense kind of little sumac forest. So it's still creating that habitat, uh, but it prevented us from needing to have ongoing uh, meadow management uh, in a challenging urban environment. Uh, we could get the benefits of the meadow while those trees grew up, and then we let them take over that site, and it's still great habitat. It's just a different kind of habitat now as it's matured. Uh, and just a, a, a plug too for um, whether you're working, you know, in, in parkland, on public lands or private land, your own backyard, reclaiming trouble spots is, is really great. So this is Americana Park. This is also in Annandale. Th th this meadow here, um, you know, with the, all that great nearly fountain men in the front, diversity of, of sedges and grasses and goldenrods here. Um, that was a sort of beat up mode field that was kind of muddy and compacted. Uh, we work with uh, the Park Authority, Department of Public Works, uh, the Dominion Energy people were involved. Uh, I forgot to mention on this slide, my apologies, but uh, Friends of Atkinson Creek were also involved in this project. Um, and uh, I, I think the end result was really good. And crucially, this was an area that was not usable uh, for recreation. It tended to attack, uh, attract trash. They already had ample parking for the facilities on site. Um, and so it, it's just a real opportunity to just create habitat. And, and I wanted to, to give a little shout out. This is uh, some photos at Marie Butler Levin Preserve in McLean. We've been working for many years. We have a lot of invasives, some of which are very, very entrenched. Um, we're doing that kind of removal by hand. Um, you know, there's there's not been, uh, because it's a small park, we're, we're just under 20 acres there. Um, this isn't a park where uh, the park authorities had a lot of budget to tackle these things. So we've done it by volunteers. All the plants that we've put in, uh, all of our hours have been donations back into this, this site. And so even on a site where we know that things are imperfect, you can see in that bottom photo, that's a lot of stilt grass. Um, you can see that that in the top right photo, um, that's not a native grapevine, that's porcelain berry. So I actually found that nest when I was pulling porcelain berry out of this native shrub and I heard squeaking and I realized, oh, there's a burst nest in here. I'll come back and wait for them to fledge and, and go back to removing the invasive porcelain berry. Uh, but there's a lot of diversity in this site nonetheless because we've continued um, despite not being able to get every invasive out, not being pristine, we've really seen a lot of interesting species come back in there. Uh, so now we have uh, bluebirds there. Uh, we saw scarlet tanager a couple of years ago. I saw an indigo bunting. Uh, I just saw the male. I, I can't, I'm not good enough to identify the females on site. We've now seen three turkeys uh, on this site. Uh, the bluebirds do breed there. Um, so we've seen a lot of interesting wildlife come back in into that space. And so I uh, really wanted to, to end on this, that, that it doesn't have to be perfect to be ecologically significant. The, 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 we can do a lot of, of positive things in our space to, uh, um, to recreate better quality habitat um, that, that are absolutely worth doing uh, without having to get everything absolutely uh, perfect. And um, that's that's the end of, of my discussion here. Uh, I hope I left a little bit of time, but I, I will uh, defer to our, our hosts here. Um, if you do, if if we're over, uh, please uh, go to our website. Uh, my email address is mbright at earthsanga.org. Uh, you can shoot it to info at earthsanga.org. We, we can get back to you and I'd be more than happy to answer questions. Matt, that was excellent. Thank you so much. I'm going to jump into some of the questions right away and please keep up your contact information because a number of people have asked for it. Um, one on the black cherry trees, what are the roots like? How close can those get to a house? Um, I think that's a, a good question. I, I would say one is that, you know, I, I, I don't have a lot of expertise on the house side, right? Um, I would say that a black cherry is maybe something to not have right against your house. I don't know about the roots, um, but because it's not a very long lived tree and it can develop some hazards, that is something to have a little bit farther away is would be my thought. It is something you can prune to keep lower though. Um, so I, I would keep that, but I, I think an oak um, may be a better bet in some of those spaces. Okay. Um, someone said she missed what you said. Um to do to save on deer framing. Can you repeat that? Yes, yeah, so we moved away from individual deer tubing or deer caging um, to caging things in mass. So we used to make individual wire cages and cage every tree and shrub individually. 
We find that that worked and it lasted for a long time, but it was very expensive. Now we plant things clustered together and we make a little deer exclosure, just one roll of fencing, either 50 feet or 100 feet, depending on the size. Um, and that is about 80% cheaper as measured on per stem, per tree and shrub protected. Okay. What kinds of shrubs would work in part shade wet meadows? Um, so if we're talking about that kind of uh, successional sort of habitat, uh, elderberry uh, is, is a very obvious choice, I think, for that. Um, elderberry, you can pull all the way into the full sun sort of components. Um, I love elderberry because it gets a lot of pollinator attention. It establishes very, very fast. Uh, and a lot of birds, especially our migratory birds, will come and eat the fruit in the fall. As you get into the shadier sections, I really like viburnum dentatum, that is our arrowwood viburnum. Um, so those two are kind of two that I would begin uh, to think about, but there's a lot of other diversity. You could think about chokeberries, you could think about hazelnuts, uh, you could think about black haw viburnum. Uh, but if we're keeping it simple, elderberry and viburnum, uh, those would be my top two. I can. <laughs> How can I remove thistles from mulch beds if manual extraction hasn't been successful? Um, it can be difficult in, in mulch beds to keep uh, persistent weedy sort of components out. So part of that is when you have mulched areas without anything growing, that, that's an open niche for a lot of things to exploit. And, you know, our thistles, we do have a few uh, native thistles, but we also have inv invasive thistles here. Um, they tend to colonize relatively quickly. They're, they're uh, biennial or monocarpic, uh, so they have very high seed viability. And really our recommendation long term for those things is plant denser. If you occupy those niches with species you like, if you have more herbaceous plants and think about heights, think about times, um, bloom times when they emerge from the ground, um, that can be a very effective way. So. I, I would say is that this is a, an area where a traditional garden technique of an herbaceous plant and then mulch and then your next herbaceous plant, that is a very time and resource intensive way to garden, but occupying more of those niches, trying to plant out in more of a meadow sort of style, just in terms of density can really help reduce weed cover. When adding new plants to the transitional zone, is it better to plant more of the natives that already exist in the woodland edge, or is it okay to introduce new species that are appropriate for the soil and sun conditions? Um, I would say that it depends on the quality of your site. So if your site's already well connected, if it's large and you have a good representation of the kind of core species that you would have, the sort of foundational elements of a plant community, th then I think it's absolutely worthwhile to begin diversifying. And, and again, um, please use our tool like our compendium with the link on the screen there. Um, you can use Department of Conservation and Recreation's Natural Heritage Program, which has data on plant communities. Um, but But I would try and work your way down what's what's relatively common um, and what is appropriate for the site and obviously what's locally native. You can use services. I know that Lut Loud and Wildlife uh, Conservancy has good resources on that too. Uh, you can use the Virginia Plant Atlas to look at what's locally native to your site. Um, and also focus on some of those keystone species. You know, if you don't have any oaks, if you don't have any cherries, that can be a real bang for your buck uh, to try and get those incorporated into the landscape. What are some of your favorite plant tree shrub combinations in any given biome? Um, I really like, and you know, I'm biased because we've been working on a site like this at Mason District. Um, I really, really love our sort of drier oak canopy for us where we see a lot of oak up top and then we transition to uh, maybe some black gum trees that are kind of mid canopy level uh, down to maple leaf viburnum as a primary shrub and then as we get kind of lower uh, seeing some of our blueberries and things like that and uh, a mix of a, a diversity of, of herbaceous layer and leaf litter um, and you know just logs and stuff that are good habitat for a lot of critters um, that that is a landscape I really really love. Um, I love being able to get maple leaf viburnum back into habitats. I think it's just 
just the merits of that plant alone, just it's gorgeous. Um, it has so much wildlife value, but viburnums and oaks together for me is always a winning combination. I, I really love seeing those two together. What should I anticipate when converting turf to a naturalized meadow area? Um, I think that one should really consider that it's going to take maybe a few passes to get all of your turf gone, depending on how well established your turf already was and what other species you have in there. So we've had good luck with sort of sheet mulching, you know, putting down flooring paper, which is just brown craft paper, uh, some kind of mulch. I, I like pine bark mulch uh, and planting in. Um, again, I would say really just do your basic foundational tough things. You will always have time to get the less common uh, species established, but if you get that foundation, th that's what creates the habitat for those other guys. So get some warm season grasses, get a couple cool season grasses. Uh, so maybe we're talking about broom sedge, maybe we're talking about wild rye, uh, get some golden rods in there, get some mountain mint, get some bone sets. Um, these are really sort of the basics that we see in a lot of our meadow habitats. Um, and then plan to continue to do some removal. If you have things like orchard grass, that can pop back up. Uh, if you have invasive vines, um, those can kind of worm their way back in. Um, so especially that initial establishment period is going to be key. And the other thing I would say is that, especially as we think about harnessing the power of succession for us, that um, don't look a gift horse in the mouth with some of the, the native but weedier things that come up. A lot of those things uh, are are evolved for this early successional habitat. They are doing a lot to help create this sort of habitat, whether it's opening up the soil, getting native soil microbiota reestablished, creating um, the microclimate that allows other things to establish. So if you have things like flea bane, um, you know, things like other sort of annuals and biennials that are native coming up, um, don't reflexively remove all of those. Definitely keep some of them around because they're helping to transition your site for you. I've had blackberry brambles, which I believe are native. I'm told they are successional shrubs that lead to trees. The problem is trees popping up are mostly Bradford pears. Do you have a problem with blackberry bushes in a meadow? Um, I, I don't have a problem with them. I, I do think that if you are managing a meadow, you will probably decide at some point that you want to manage uh, your blackberries and maybe keep them to a certain area. And we, we've done this, say, at, at uh, Marie Butler Levin Preserve. We have a big blackberry patch um, there. It's primarily Rubus pensylvanicus. Um, and we have, have managed that those areas to keep them smaller. We have found that some species, uh, some of our native species are more aggressive than others, and we certainly have some non-native uh, blackberries. We have uh, what, what lineberry, which should absolutely be removed. That's the one with the really hairy stems. Uh, we have some Himalayan blackberry, but that sometimes the identification gets confused. Um, but of our native ones, you know, things like the, the sand blackberry, um, the, the Pennsylvania blackberry, um, you may wanna just constrain those to a few sites or a few patches, I should say. <laughs> the one thing I would caution with managing blackberries is most of our native blackberries only fruit on the older stems. So the first year growth of that stem, it doesn't flower, it doesn't fruit. Next year, that same stem, as it gets tougher and thornier, will fruit and flower. Um, so it's really important, I think, from a native blackberry management perspective, uh, that you're not cutting them back every year. Because if you do cut them back every year, um, you're not going to see those flowers, so you're depriving our pollinators, and you're not going to see that fruit, so you're depriving, uh, you know, our birds and small mammals and things that, that may make use of that. Um, but I, I think that that in terms of, um, you know, keeping it relegated to a corner of your, your uh, meadow or a certain part of your edge, uh, absolutely, I think that's within the scope of, of uh, good, 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 good management if you're getting other native stuff established to take up its place. It's really encouraging to see this idea happening in some of our public spaces. Do you think the, the it's catching on, Matt? Um, I do. Idea? And does it and does the problem with ticks work against it? Um, I I think that you know 
Ticks are, are a symptom, I think, of a number of problems in, in our landscape. And, and first and foremost is, is deer overabundance, you know? And I, I think finding uh, ways to, to control uh, deer where they are overabundant is a big thing that we can do to manage uh, not just ticks, but a lot of human wildlife sort of conflict. And, and that, that doesn't need to be um, an, an inhumane uh, option either, though, though I would say that, that um, the evidence shows that, that culling is, is the best tool uh, in our toolkit, but to delve into that is a whole other talk. Um, I would say that I think it's really exciting to to be managing these these ecotones. You know, we have a lot of really really great spaces. I I think I showcase a number of them. And, and this isn't to say that this management is not happening in Loudon. It absolutely is happening in Loudon. There are some phenomenal areas. Um, if if folks go out to to uh, B Banshee Reeks parks, they're great meadows. They're great forests, and they're great transitions between the two of them. Uh, it's just, I'm a Fairfax kid, so I have a lot of examples uh, from Fairfax County. Uh, I'd love to spend more time uh, in Loudoun County too, but as I said, it's it's a lot of driving. Um, but it's it's really exciting, and I think that, crucially, that kind of management is doing a lot to both improve plant conservation, uh, both on a species level in terms of keeping some of our rare plants or less common plants in good health, keeping our plant communities in good shape. Uh, and crucially, I think it's doing a lot on the wildlife side too. So I think this is really uh, something that, that we can do ecologically um, and we're, we're gonna see just a lot of benefits from a lot of different things. And I should mention as we talk about the deer too, you know, our, our poor deer, which are hungry and are, you know, went through yet another hard winter, uh, you know, they're native critters too. They have every right to be here. Uh, I'm not saying we need to get rid of every one of them. And they, by and large, would prefer to eat native plants too. So getting these native plants back in improves the habitat for everything. Um, you know, we, we absolutely have a lot of deer around here and there needs to be some kind of solution. Uh, but absolutely improving the, the habitat quality is, is good for all uh, our wildlife, whether it's big megafauna like deer, uh, all the way down to little things like these sweat bees and things like that here. All right, Matt, thank you again. Thank you so much for all the good work you're doing. And thank you for spreading your intelligence with us. And thank you all for attending the program. It's been recorded and will be on Loudoun County Public Library's YouTube page in just a few days. Bye-bye.